something I spend a lot of time thinking about is what makes a piece of art impactful emotionally. Traditionally taught, we're, we're taught that line and brushwork is important to create form and a cadence. Um, composition is important to create focus. Subject matter um, is important to create intrigue. And all of these are important, but for me, the most important part in to, to making transitive art is color. Um, color communicates the same way music does. So take this blue, for example. It hits you like a foghorn and completely overwhelms your senses. It's, it's almost deafening. This is actually the color blue that Yves Klein uses for all of his work. And it's for a good reason. It's very emotive or evocative. Both color and music uh, bypass your logic to engage directly with our guts. And that is really cool to me. Less thinking and more feeling. Um, today I would like to kind of narrow the scope and focus on a principle that I find to be very useful when creating color palettes, and that is the relationship between value and color. And this is kind of tricky, so I thought I would break it down. So color is, light comes to the earth from the sun, and we interpret these wavelengths, both short and long, as color. So each wavelength is assigned a color. The value, or the luminance, is the perceived lightness of these wavelengths. So to better depict this, the, the one at the top shows the color palette, and the one um, below shows the black and white, the value scale. Any artist before the middle of the 18th century would first paint the composition in black and white to establish, to establish the values, um, which is what is called an underpainting, and then they would glaze the color over it. Um, and that is because value is very important to understand as an artist, because value makes the thing we are painting appear three-dimensional or not. But determining the difference in the value of two colors is harder than you'd think. So let's zoom in here on this Durain painting. This is actually of Henry Matisse. Um, I need some audience participation here. Uh, which hue or which color do you think would be the darkest value? So on a scale of, of white to black, um, this is what we're determining. Who would think that number one would be the darkest value? Raise your hands. Okay, we've got four. Okay, number two. Okay, majority, three. And then four. Okay. All right, the answer is actually one. Um, and if you did say number two, you should still feel proud of yourself because they are almost equiluminant. But if you chose three or four, I hope this uh, quote by Joseph Albers, who is a famous art and color theorist, uh, will make you feel better. He said, if one is not able to distinguish the difference between a higher tone and a lower tone, one should probably not make music. If a parallel conclusion were to be made for color, almost everyone would be incompetent for its proper use. Very, very few are able to distinguish high and lower light values between different hues. Only a minority can distinguish lighter from darker within um, closer intervals. So here's the interesting part. When you put two colors of equal value close to each other, there is a palpable and visible tension, as you can see in this piece. Impressionist artists were pros at using equiluminant colors to evoke this effervescent quality typical of the genre. It was in this period that artists began to paint outside because paint was being tubed so they could travel with it. Um, they were not concerned with painting realistic translation of the scenes. Their goal was to give a personal and emotional impression of it. And by using equiluminant colors, they could successfully communicate the movement and the energy and the poetry they were after. So if you're still a little confused about equiluminance, um, here's another example that I think is a little more a little easier to, to see. Um, as you can see more obviously here, the vibration can be pretty powerful. It can even be hard to look at, with a great, which is a great tool for artists who want to evoke a feeling from their, from their artwork, um, especially nausea. With this one, I get nauseous. I get almost seasick. Um, here we have another Impressionist painting. Um, by Claude Monet. This is actually the painting that's supposedly inspired the name for the movement. Um, it's called Impression Sunrise, which is a moody interpretation of Don um, over his hometown in northern France. 
So take a look at these four spots. I'm going to need your participation again. Um, we're trying to decide which one is the lightest value here. So in this painting, who thinks number one would be the lightest area? Absolutely no one. OK. Two? Three? And then four? OK. Majority of y'all said four. Here we go. Let's take a look. It is four. Well done. So you should text your parents and tell them you are quitting your day job to become the next Monet. Um, the area four is the lightest value in the painting, and one is the darkest. Um, is anyone surprised that the sun wasn't the lightest area in the painting? Because logically, the sun is the source of light for our planet and for this painting. You would think that Monet would want it to be um, the lightest spot. But he, he didn't do that. Um, Margaret Livingston, a professor in the Department of Neurobiology at Harvard Medical School, said it puts it perfectly when she says that there is a quavering luminosity that exists between the sun and the clouds. There's this push and this pull, and it makes you feel the weight of the sun, and it, it feels like it's slowly rising. There's a vibration. So what would happen if Monet had made a different choice? Let's see. The altered image here looks kind of bizarre, doesn't it? The whole painting looks desaturated. The tension is completely gone. And this is the power of the artist and the genius of, tr of truly great artists. These small decisions come from the gut and are supposed to be interpreted in kind. Um, so here's some other art that should be felt in your gut. From Jazz Stories by Faith Ringgold, there's an equiluminance in the, in the blue squiggles in the red background that perfectly expresses the electricity and the urgency of jazz music. Van Gogh's Sunflowers, the acidic color palette, just as we were talking about, combined with the vibration of the yellow background and the lime sunflower centers, which are equiluminant with each other, helps the flowers look like they're almost shivering and the whole piece feels like it's moving, which is common with any of Van Gogh's work. He did equiluminance a lot, or he used it. And then Yayoi Kusama, she, like Van Gogh, her work is deeply psychological. And she lets us look into how her brain processes and organizes information. Um, the colors and the shapes feel like they're buzzing against each other, almost like we're watching the synapses in her brain being fired. By now, we can see how equiluminance can be utilized in the fine art realm. But I'm also a designer and a makeup artist, so I have to show you all some examples of it in the real world. So this is actually a famous piece um, where he was exploring motion in art. And you can see how the equiluminant colors contrasted with the white and black. It makes it look like these circles are moving. It's also, it was used a lot in the 70s for that trippy uh, art poster. They were experimenting with LSD, and they wanted their art to reflect that um, these trippy experiences. And you can see the vibration between the pink and the red um, makes it feel like it's radiating. You can also see it in evocative interior design, the tonal uh, 70s color palettes on the right-hand side, the harmony between the colors of the, the chairs sing together and create a rich palette and makeup design, um, the contrasting emerald with that deep orchid looks so fresh and striking and modern. And in styling, um, this is why those pale colors look so good with Emma's pale skin tone, that equiluminescence between her skin and that electric yellow. And I'm sure you all know this cover we could all feel the tension here. We knew something was coming. Um, perfectly done between the blues and the yellows. So color is a powerful tool. And I would encourage you all to open your ears and your eyes and your hearts to the color around you. Thank you.